Composer Will Bates of the Fall on Your Sword studio always has several television projects on the go, including Emmy contenders Unbelievable and Hillary this year. I'm Riley Chow of Gold Derby, and I want to ask Will, is it different composing for fiction versus nonfiction? Um, you know, I try to kind of keep the beginning of the process pretty much the same. Um, I guess when I'm coming up with those themes and figuring out instrumentation and harmony, I, I treat it as, as, as a cinematic experience. I guess it was something that I learned from, uh, from director Alex Gibney, who tends to treat his movies in that way. Um, at least at the beginning of the process, it's the same. And then with a doc, it, it, it changes as you get more into it, because ultimately there's just a lot more music in a documentary. And sometimes you have to stay out of the way a little bit more, um, because obviously there's a lot of dialogue and, archival and that kind of thing. But um, I would say that the the most important part of any project for me tends to be those first few sessions, those first few moments of really dialing in a, a character. And I, I always talk about the, the like eureka moment that I tend to have to have when I start a project. And sometimes that's behind a piano coming up with a chord sequence or a, a melody for something that's intrinsically connected to a character or, or a plot line. And I, I tend to have the same experience on both a narrative and a doc when I'm starting out. But yeah, like I said, then it tends to go somewhere else entirely. I'm wondering how you feel about the new Emmy category that they introduced last year for documentary scores. Uh, as an outsider, it looked like, you know, fiction uh, was winning the score categories every year. And then finally, a documentary beat all the fiction contenders, and the next year they were shuffled off to their own categories. I'm wondering mm -hmm. what your thoughts are about that. I think it's I think it's right to treat it as a separate a separate award. It's a it's a different kind of skill set. Um, I do think that you know sometimes it, I feel like documentaries don't necessarily get the attention that they sometimes deserve in terms of their scores. So it's great to finally be shining a light on them in that sense and simply because there's so much content now, um, it is just better, I think, for there to be another arena for those pieces to exist. All right, let's get into talking about Unbelievable. Uh, I found at the end of the show, you know, after the eight episodes and after all the years that the series spans, uh, I felt a real weight to it. And I think a lot of that was part of, you know, uh, thanks in part to the score. Uh, so can you go into, kind of uh kind of what feeling uh you were able to evoke of course yeah so the showrunners and i talked a lot at the beginning about this this internal concept for the score that it really should be internalizing everything that marie is going through in this first in that first episode and then kind of moving through her story so it really required kind of a light touch, I guess, um, and especially especially at the beginning. And any time that it veered too dark, it, it it seemed to kind of veer too much into despair. And there is almost like this sense that Marie, in order to be able to deal with what she's gone through, that she she has to somehow evoke a sense of of hope. Um, so there there's there was constantly this fine line of of the darkness of what's happening and then the the feeling that we can at least attempt to go towards some kind of resolution. Um, and we talked a lot about, you know, obviously she's been forced to retell and re-experience this, this terrible experience over and over again. And um, in order to evoke that, I did a lot of stuff with like repeated um, like tape loops that that are just kind of repeating and tend to decay and fall apart as they're, as they're kind of being retold. Um, and that really helped to kind of bring out this sort of fragmented memory that she seems to be experiencing. Um, but yeah, there's, there's also this thematic idea. She's very, she's obviously very vulnerable and, and frail and, you know, amongst this kind of clinical backdrop there there is this strong identifiable theme that um that i'm sometimes using you know, sort of organic ways to play it so i'll be taking a prepared piano picking it with my fingers and using tape loops created by the mellotron 
um, and bowed harps, that kind of thing. There's a, a constant sort of juxtaposition between the, the sort of synthetic clinical reality and then this more human, frail, fragile, melodic idea. And that's, that's really Marie. And then obviously when the detectives are more focused in the story, it becomes much more kind of propulsive and thematic connected to them and, and their relationship. Um, so there's a lot of different, a lot of different layers, a lot of different feelings, but ultimately it needed to be quite minimal. And, and like I said, kind of a light touch. I, th I think that was important. Anytime it took over performances, it, it, it just needed to be more restrained because these performances are so extraordinary on their own. Anyway, I think the purpose of the score is to really try and bring out something that isn't necessarily on screen at that moment. If that makes sense. Yeah, I got these great notes from your publicist saying that uh, the tape loops that you were talking about were made from obscure metal objects. Yeah. Uh, so can you go into what that means? Sure. So we um we needed to get some kind of um, procedural element, and you know, there's again there are these these long sequences of of everything that she's been forced to go through at the beginning of the investigation. And rather than kind of rely on this conventional procedural tropes, the sort of bubbling, beeping synth thing, um, we decided to try something different. And I wanted to, again, evoke uh, that feeling of like constantly moving forward and propulsion, but have a, a more human element to it. So I called up my friend Matthias Kunzi, who's a fantastic percussionist, and he brought over every conceivable like, gong and bell and weird metal object and filled his car with it and brought it over to the studio. I think he must have had like, I don't know, 50 or 60 different random things. And we hung them all around the, the live room and he just would play these very simple rhythms. And, and I would just have three or four bars of them. And it just kind of created this, this really great toolkit for me to use throughout the season of any time that we needed that movement and that sort of, again, that procedural thing that sometimes these sequences require it was done in quite an odd, jilted way that I I think was quite effective and has a kind of minimalism to it as well. Can you talk about composing for these concurrent stories that happen in Unbelievable, where Marie, she never actually meets the detectives. Uh, and then there are also the flashbacks. Uh, so yeah, I'm wondering if you, you know, how much you decided to make kind of a unified score or you wanted them to be separate pieces? I think at first they're, they're pretty separate. Um, there's, I, I always thought it was a, quite amazing that Tony Collette's character doesn't appear until the very end of episode two. And really at that moment, there's a cue that happens right at the end of that episode that is pretty new and has certain rhythmic elements. I, again, use some of Matthias's stuff in that one, but, um, you know, in terms of the harmony and the instrumentation and the melody, it's it's a bit of a departure. And moving into the next couple of episodes, it was helpful for me for there to be these two different voices, that there is this kind of, it's more guitar, there's a little bit of guitar stuff in the detectives, there was a, a very different melodic, identifiable theme for them, um, and some more sense and whatnot. It was. It, at first, easier to have them be separate, and then as we get closer to the conclusion, they start to coalesce. And when they when they make the connection with Marie herself, then I was able to bring in certain elements of her melody. And sometimes, you know, very fragmented pieces of her melody appear in in their world, so to speak. Um, so it's almost like yeah, two different things that then kind of coalesce towards the end, and that it sort of culminates in this final cue where. Um, she finally calls um, Detective Duval and, and then there's the queue afterwards and it's basically a kind of a combination of everyone's theme and a more simple piano version of it. All right. Uh, what about, how did you get the job on Unbelievable? Um, gosh, that's a good question. I think it was through... Liza Richardson, who is the music supervisor, yeah. on, she and I had worked on a show called The Path and uh, and a couple of other things with Jason K. Timms. And she um, she introduced me to the showrunners and, and yeah, we just started talking and we 
we really hit it off. I met with Lisa Cholodenko, who, who uh, directed the first three episodes. Um, yeah, it was, it was Liza. It was awesome. I feel like I can see how you two would know each other, since she is also always working on, like, six shows at a time. Right, yeah, and DJing, and, yeah, she has a pretty interesting, she has a pretty cool career. Um, yeah, the constant juggle. <laughs> Uh, now let's jump over to Hillary. Uh, first of all, I'll just get out of the way. Did you actually meet Hillary Clinton? I didn't. You know, I was going to go to Sundance, and then in the end, I have two kids, and there was another project that was going on, so it just wasn't. I couldn't make it happen, unfortunately. But I do remember when I first got that gig, I I was in New York because the whole production was based over there, and uh, I was at Nanette's office, and she was like, "Yeah, you know, Hillary, Hillary's just down the block. We're on, I think it's on Forty Eighth Street." Um, I guess her office is a few blocks away. So the whole time during the process, I was kind of waiting to get my notes from Hillary, but it, it never happened. There's some sax parts in that show as well. And uh, I really wanted to get some bill notes, but pff, sadly not. Yeah, uh, what did you infuse from her life and maybe her musical tastes uh, into your score? Um, you know, I never got a chance to ask her what she likes to listen to, so I, I kind of when I took my direction from the net but um you know one of the interesting things about that the way that that show is structured is this kind of dual timeline scenario so in that first episode there's a lot of stuff explaining her her background and her childhood and then you know her, her life at college and it was a, a good place for me to begin to write some themes for her that I was then able to refer to whenever the the timelines kind of intersected and that was that was a really useful tool for me so i took some of the melodies from from her background and would then manipulate them and kind of take some of the almost like sampling them and turning them into kind of fragmented versions of themselves with a much more contemporary backdrop for the more contemporary storylines um it was almost like that's taking melodies and then having things that would allude to her ideals from the past. It was, it was a useful set of tools. And do you know what episodes you're submitting from each of these two shows for any consideration? Yeah, I think I'm submitting the first episode from, from each of them. Um, and with Unbelievable, just to jump that back there for a second, that it was a tough choice because that first episode is, it sets up a bunch of different themes, but there's nothing of the detectives that's in that first episode. But I, I always, um, like I said, I feel like the first, the first thing that I write for a show tends to be the thing that I connect with personally the most. So it, it that was my choice. Um, and the same case with Hillary. And do you have uh, an interesting origin story for your work on Hillary? Um, the way that we met, uh, I think I met Nanette through some editors that had actually worked with Alex Gibney. So I, um, I lived in New York before, before I moved out here five years ago. I was in New York for 13 years and kind of got my start doing a lot of New York indie films and New York documentaries. And through Alex and a few different filmmakers, I met a lot of editors. And um, one of the editors then jumped into work with Nanette and, and he introduced Nanette to my work and they I think he had a hard drive of stuff of mine because I remember when um when I watched the first edit I was like oh that's the path and that's from iOrigin so they had obviously <laughs> taken some of my stuff and sometimes that that happens that's a way that composers jump around and, and get the gig is they they tend to cut to music that they mm -hmm. make online and, and then fall in love with something and why not just call the person that wrote that thing? So fortunately, that's what happened in this case. And what did they say when you came on board about what they were hoping to achieve with uh, the music? Well, the, I, I think the main thing was really the tone, and, and that's really reflected in, in the story. It's very, it needed to be neutral, but also describe what's happening. And um, there was a lot of, we, were, we had to be quite careful to kind of constantly th tread that a fine line between it being too, you know, the, the the election loss, portraying that as too much of a tragedy or like portraying the positive 
is too heroic and you know it's it's it was very tricky tonally to get that that fine balance and i think for me probably the hardest piece of music to write was was one of the last things on in the fourth episode when we're we're talking about the loss of the election but we're also talking about hillary's incredible career and the incredible things that she was able to achieve for herself and for women and you know I, it, she is a hero so there was this fine line of the tragic versus you know celebrating her life and in in the end there was a kind of elegiac tone i think that we kind of settled on but really that was that was the main thing and also to you know not try to lean on too many conventional forms of documentary instrumentation to try and have it be somewhat contemporary whilst also you know being able to describe things from the past because there is a lot of archival in there so you know Nanette allowed me to explore and experiment a fair bit so it's a lot of fun and finally uh, the magicians this year they had another musical episode and then the next episode was the series finale so can you talk about sending off that show um yeah i mean god that was a huge part of my life that show it really the magicians was the beginning of my tv career and uh i will never forget it <laughs> so it was a very it was a bittersweet pill to swallow having to do that final one and um you know it allowed me to listen through to a lot of the old cues a lot of the earlier stuff from uh, pre previous seasons and you know i tried to bring in some themes from uh, obviously you know um quentin's character was no longer in the show but i snuck in a couple of references to him in that final scene and um yeah i'm very sad to see it go but man what a what a ride i think i don't think that we anticipated that it would last for five seasons it turned into a hit and everyone's just you know moving on to bigger and better things all right well we look forward to seeing those bigger and better things for you and uh well thanks for mu so much for taking the time to chat to our viewers you can check out our youtube channel for other interviews with emmy contenders and you can go to goldderby.com to make your own emmy predictions mm -hmm.